Okay, the Barefoot Ecologist Toolbox, Rescaling Fisheries Management. Um, I'm told you should always have an outline, and in my case it's mainly just to try and uh, help you believe this is an ordered, structured talk rather than just a stream of consciousness rave, but that's my plan of attack. I'll see how I go. Um, really, sort of talking about the problem, what came out of my doctoral studies, and uh, the view of the world it gave me, and then some of the solutions that I eventually came to. I ended up just depressed at the scale of the problem. And then some of the elements that I, I think we need to be to working on and developing to, to address the problems. Um, so my beginning in, in fisheries, my doctoral studies, was I arrived in Tasmania at the southern end of the world, opposite end of the world to here, and was uh, given the problem of the abalone fishery. Tasmania is the world's largest abalone fishery. It's its third biggest uh, primary industry. Um, and we had this very bleak uh, scenario going on with, with well catches of, despite quite active management, a steady decline since its peak in 69. And, and uh, the overwhelming uh, the, the consensus at that point in time was that these were just unproductive animals, naturally unproductive. Broadcast spawning was uh, not an effective means of propagating, despite the fact they'd persisted for millions of years. And, uh, and um, the, the juveniles were naturally rare, high survival of juveniles, and just these uh, long lead aggregations that the fishermen mined out, and oh well, you know, there's no future for abalone. And uh, I set about pondering that and uh, assimilating what I could about abalone. I went to the library, read what the scientists thought, and I've just told you what they thought. And I also sat down and talked to the divers. And that was a natural thing for me to do. I, I was in marine biology because I was a at that stage a competition breath hold diver, um, spearing fish, and, and I knew that if I wanted to do well in that, um, it was about local knowledge. I didn't go and talk to someone in a white lab coat, I went and talked to a diver. And then most of these guys who I was diving against nationally uh, had ended up down in this fishery in Tasmania. So I knew these guys, they mainly beat me in the competitions, I knew they could teach me something. So I went and sat at their feet. And one of the things in the literature, Mia Tegna had uh, um, drifted bottles around the Californian bite, She'd watched the larvae in, in tanks and hatcheries and, and they swam around for about 10 days and so her drift bottles moved about 80, 90 kilometres in 10 days. So the, the working assumption was that the larvae were dispersing 80, 90 kilometres. And, and we were modelling the, the fisheries as a, you know, a statewide, a large phenomena, one stock assessment for an entire state or province. But the divers were telling me about individual reefs dying. You know, a reef at the head of the bay, the front of the bay, was gone. We used to take big catches there. Now there's nothing. But we're still fishing at the back of the bay. We go back there every year. It's still, still fishing. To me, that didn't seem consistent with, uh, with this 80 or 90 kilometres larval drift. And um, then, so I was thinking about it already when I, was, I was, uh, found a technique for finding the juveniles, and lo and behold, the juveniles weren't rare at all if you just... Uh, stopped uh, believing you were a big brain mammal that would see them despite their camouflage and, and use some other techniques that broke their camouflage. Then it turned out they were just like any other invertebrate or fish, lots of juveniles. And when I was doing that, I was studying larval growth, I mean juvenile growth, and uh, one season I saw an a-seasonal settlement and it was confined to an area of about 25 square metres. There was nowhere else on the reef. And that certainly didn't seem consistent with uh, um, widespread dispersal of larvae. And so I set up a number of experiments. And don't worry about the detail of this. The message is all in these summary figures down this side. But basically, this is Tasmania, south of Australia. And on sections of, of shoreline only about 60 uh, metres long, no narrow strip of bottom, I did removal experiments where I stripped out the adult, the breeding stock. And then I came back after the, the settlement and I looked for where the, the larvae had ended up. And this is what I saw it. This here down here was the breeding stock. This was the unmanipulated breeding stock. This is an average across here. And this was the, the unmanipulated density across our sites, you know, the two controls and, uh, and the, uh, the manipulated site. This was the result of our manipulation. This is the depression we did in the breeding stock. So at the time of breeding, that was the pattern of breeding stock. And this up here was the pattern of larval settlement we got. We repeated this a number of times, and we showed that you could, on scales of tens of metres, we could manipulate recruitment by manipulating breeding biomass. And that really opened our eyes to the fact that we were dealing with not one fishery, but probably a thousand fisheries, or, or maybe as much as 10,000 fisheries in this one state. 
But first, dealing with that shock, and then we read literature, and literature explains, you know, if, if all the stocks are fairly uniform and, and uh, same sort of size and maturity, and they're fished evenly, and, and all the rest, uh, then it'll be okay. You can still manage it as one fishery. But unfortunately, the, the world wasn't quite that simple. So when we started looking at it, we'd always known that different reefs had different sized abalone. And uh, what it turns out is that we have the, these abalone, and I believe it's probably true of more animals than we realise, though actually its maturity was mainly driven, first order effect was age, and size was a second order effect. So these are two profiles of two sort of relatively randomly chosen populations only a few kilometres apart. They weren't chosen to illustrate the point I'm going to illustrate. They were just chosen at the beginning of my doctoral studies as two convenient places to study. So what you've got in this top bar is uh, you've got a reference line here which is the size, in each case is the legal size limit. So this up here is the cryptic juvenile population which stays hidden away under the rocks in the dark, um, acting basically using the, the crevice space as protection against predators that prize them off the rock. This is the adult population. For many years, the scientist and most literature still assumes that these guys don't exist. It's only these guys. These are the long-lived aggregations prone to exploitation. If you, I won't bother explaining it all here, but what you see here is a very similar shaped growth curve, particularly with regard to age. The biggest difference is your size and maturity. One's about 40 mils bigger than the other. The actual range right around Tasmania is probably as much as 100 millimetres difference in the small size, even maybe up to... Uh, 110, 120 millimetres difference between the smaller size of maturity and the larger size of maturity. So these ones are only about 40 mils apart, 30 mils apart, something like that. What you, this is the gonad index, and what you see is that the, in each case, maturity, the beginning of maturity is about five years old. These guys are about 60 mils. These guys are about 100 mils when they start maturing. These are similar, apart from the different effects of exploitation, while these animals are only 60 to 100, and these are more 100 to 160, basically similar age profile if you take into account the, the uh, um, different exploitation pressure. But then look at then the effect of that size limit. This population is almost entirely closed to fishing. This population is never going to be recruitment overfished. It's going to persist forever as long as we obey the law. This population is a victim waiting to happen. And where do the divers like to fish? Do they like to sort through hundreds of abalone to find a single-sized abalone? No, they don't. They like to leave their gauge in the boat and legally take everything they see. This is where they get the catch rate. Each abalone here is probably twice as heavy as each abalone here. So these are the populations they selectively focus on. And these are the populations that slowly disappear, one by one. And so the divers talk about non-recovery bottom. And we, die, we scientists for ages focused on the ecological. What is it about the ecology of these areas that make them unsuitable for abalone to persist? It was just the size of them. It wasn't protecting anything. Oops, sorry. Need to... So, and, and we see this sort of variability at all scales, across all scales. First of all, illustrating with New Zealand. Here's a study that was done. Uh, uh, and these were study, all of these were studies of populations that in their area were recognised as being uh, what we call stunted populations. By that we just mean relative to the size limit there's a small size of maturity, a small maximum size relative to the size limit. So in that previous slide this is the stunty population here and this is the what we would call the normal population. So if you go from Taranaki up in the warm water this is the legal size in New Zealand, which was set by research about here, up in the warm water, very low size of maturity, uh, around here, uh, slightly higher size of maturity, down to the east coast of Stewart Island, much higher size of maturity. If you come around to the very rugged west coast around here, you'll probably see a growth curve that is way up here, something like that. All of this being managed by one national size limit. When you come, so that's a scale of hundreds of kilometres, and that's very much related to water temperature. When you come down to a scale of tens of kilometres, this is about 40 kilometres here to here. This is right down in the southwest corner. This is an area that for 15 years I actually had a commercial licence to uh, free dive for four tonnes of abalone. That was my summer job. Um, and what you see is a very, very exposed coastline here coming around into a sheltered bay. And at smaller, smaller scales, 
It's largely about water movement. The abalone like to sit still on the bottom and be force fed by, out, by strong currents pushing chopped up seaweed into their mouths. And then they grow like steam. And so around here, very high size of maturity. In here, dirty water, and as you come into this sheltered bay, you get down to a point where nothing is legal size. High densities, but nothing is legal size. So the early fishery here, you don't have to use your gauge, you can leave it in the boat, and you can take everything you see. The fishery never used to venture into here. We all used to be out there. But this area has recruitment collapsed. There's a bay in here where in the 80s, uh, my partner used to get five tonne personally out of one bay. The last time I swam that in the early 2000s, we took five abalone in the whole bay. You know, and, and I'm going to get to a point about we need to set up systems which motivate us the right way. And that's fisheries management, all about motivating the fishermen for sustainability. You know, the crime about this system is there's 40 divers have access to this area. The day we swam this bay, uh, there was another diver coming straight between us, behind us. We should have left those five abalone behind but they're only going to have about 15 minutes more life. So we took them. You know, it's about motivation, this whole thing. So anyway, so this area is now recruitment collapsed. Any day the weather comes right, everyone's in here, sorting through all those little abalone looking for size. The stats show catch rates have been quite stable. This is all part of the same statistical zone. It doesn't know that there's nothing out here now. It looks like this area is stable. So then you come down to the next scale, two kilometres here. This is Greenlip on the west coast of, of uh, um, Australia. And uh, about two kilometres here, this is a map produced for me with the assistance of uh, the original abalone diver in this area. The dark indicates a very big size of maturity, a large maximum size. The, uh, the light indicates a, a stunty population. The size limits set up by the state because the researchers always chose areas that were protected and sheltered to do the research in. We set our size limits very low. Didn't protect any of the big areas. This area was discovered late. The divers had an inkling of what was going on. And so they, uh, they had a voluntary size limit that basically protected most of what was there. And the area stabilised about 30 tonnes a year. Eventually, one of the, the lowest common denominator in the group of divers, uh, for the first time in his life, decided he was going to obey the law. He broke the voluntary agreement. There was a gold rush. This area collapsed into these stunty areas. And uh, um, the catch, when we started working this area, the catch was about eight tonnes and still going down. We weren't able to actually turn that situation around. And again, this indicates the, I tell this little bit of anecdote just to illustrate the, the range of people we have to work with and the difficulty of working with voluntary agreements because of some of the people you end up working with. You can't choose your neighbours in in the fishery any more than you can in the rest of life. But the guy who broke this voluntary agreement was eventually removed and the voluntary agreement could be uh, re reinstated and more. Um, but the guy who broke it, you know, the caliber of the man who removed because he was sent to jail for killing his wife with an axe. You know, and this is the guy, this is the guy we were hanging on to have a voluntary agreement. So th these are all the elements of this thing, you know, the complexity of, of uh, the human nature and the complexity of the biological nature. So how do you deal with this? Um, it's all about managing variability. So what I've got here is, is a list of shells. Different. These are all legal size. These are only just legal size. All out of the one zone, probably about 100 kilometres of shoreline. Um, you can, these animals here are probably the rounder shells with this gnarly stuff inside that's a breeding scar. These guys have probably been breeding for 20 years before they finally became legal. These guys down here, way over the legal size, never bred in their life. And we're trying to manage this with a zonal TAC and zonal size limits. And we wonder why we've got individual, why the divers are saying we have a problem, we're losing reefs, and your zonal model is picking up none of it. So it's all about, this is the, the two populations I showed you before, comparing their growth rates. You know, the size limit was about here uh, for that that in Tasmania at that time and, and we had populations that were being fished as a, just a newly matured animal or a very mature animal. And this is the type, the reality we're actually trying to deal with. So and when you have this type of complexity, you have a lot of very perverse effects going on. Um, one of the things is stock assessments don't mean what you think they mean. You know, they're, they're getting a very, very crude average of what's going on and they invariably tell you you've got a large unproductive biomass which is 
uh, declining slowly. They don't actually, they underestimate the depletion, they overestimate the original biomass, and they also underestimate actually how productive the stock can be if managed properly. Now, these management doesn't do what you think it's going to do. You raise a size limit, which you think should just unabashedly protect more breeders. But in fact, you've got a mix of stocks. You've got stocks where the, the size limit needs to be so high um, to do any protection at all, and other stocks which are underfished and already heavily protected. So you raise the size limit, you overprotect even more the stunty stocks, and you concentrate your TAC on a smaller group of highly vulnerable reefs. So you speed up the process of cereal depletion. You get these counterintuitive effects going on. So, this is what I call the tyranny of scale. You know, we've got in this fishery we have the world's best management. Size limits in the early 60s, limited entry, limited number of divers in the 60s, late 60s, uh, ITQ management in the 80s. Um, it's all there, all the size limits, everything. And yet the fishery has slowly been depleting. The TACs are trending down. It's got so you know so severe in a lot of areas that uh, even the zonal assessments are picking up the decline. So we've got this. We've got these regional scale assessment and management going on over hundreds of kilometres. Uh, these days we've actually got our data collection down to the scale of tens of kilometres. But the challenge is actually getting down to the scale of the beast, down to a scale of metres and hundreds of metres. And how are we going to do that? That's the challenge. And I'll argue that, that really when you're down to that scale, it's below the scale at which the state can act and you're down to having to work with the people. There's no way around it. The scale of the management is only, can only be rated to by the individual. Now, up until now, it's all been abalone. And, and all you non-abalone biologists will say, yeah, well, I'm glad I don't work on abalone fisheries. But what I'm here to tell you is that at some level, I believe this is universal. Sure, animals have very different scales about them. And you know, I think up in this part of the world, you've, you've known about this sort of stuff with Pacific salmon. Um, I think it very, very generally applies to demersal invertebrates. Both this, uh, uh, they're more localised in their recruitment, more self-recruiting than we think, and more variable in their fundamental parameters than we think. Tropical reef species have it for sure. I think more and more you're waking up to it with rockfish. Um, sea mount fin fish definitely have it. Even some of these wide-ranging sharks are turning out to be philopatric, and so they're like a salmon. They mix that on the feeding grounds, but they home to their natal pupping grounds, and you can fish them out inshore bay by inshore bay by killing off localised stocks. Uh, it's being implicated with North Atlantic cod. wasn't one big spawning aggregation, but might have been, I don't know what the lotus count is, 14, 15 or something, smaller stocks. I mean, even something like lobster with 18 months in the life cycle, they used to think the Jasus lobster in Australia New Zealand might go all the way around the, the polar seas before it lands back because its larval life is about that length of time. That, right. Recently, um, well, six years ago now, a New Zealand fisherman prospecting down south of Pitcairn Island over here, um, actually out here, found the first new species of lobster discovered in 200 years. Now, no one can, it's only on two seamounts. You know, no one can imagine that's going all around the polar sea and finding its way back there. It's, there's got to be some sort of behaviour and lo use of local mesoscale oceanographic features to have some sort of retention. You know, and I would argue that this is, at some scale, really, this problem is universal. Um, really, I, I think, uh, you know, and Hilborn and Oronson and Palmer, small is difficult. Um, is, is uh, they, they, you know, I can now cite them as one of the three principal reasons for failure of fisheries assessment is the, manage, is the mismatch between the scale of management and scale of assessment and the scale of biological stocks. Let me put a schematic up here. This is dispersal distance. This is proportion of population. Uh, this dispersal distance will be different sizes for different animals. But really, dispersal isn't a black or white thing. It's a distribution. And out here, there's a tail which is maintained by behaviour to keep a species invasive. This tail is important over hundreds of years and over geographical timescales. Otherwise, every time there's a sea level change, your species will go extinct. You have to keep finding and colonising new habitat if you want to propagate the species. But the action for management is down here. And we have been fixated with tagging studies and with genetics and stuff out on this tail. But it's in here that you have to think if you're a manager. You know, this is the scale of average tagging movements not the uh, record tagging movements we get really excited about. Um, maybe some of the more modern um, genetics is ranging us into here. Uh, 
But this is where we need to be focused. And it's a trend that I've been watching for 15, 20 years now, that more and more as we get more sophisticated techniques, we're redefining the scale of dispersal for most of our species. Things are more complex than we thought. And when you come to this realisation, as I did at the end of my doctorate, you look around as a government biologist, as a government manager, and you realise there's just way too much environment out there for managing and not enough taxpayers to pay for it all. You know, what are you going to do? This is the problem. You know, we have a shrinking public sector that's uh, meant to look after all these beautiful resources, and we have a myriad of, of micro stocks and a myriad of fishermen, and this yawning gap between the need and the suppliers. And really, that was at that point when I finished my doctorate, I was about ready to find another field to work in. And I was sitting around drinking heavily with another friend of mine who was equally depressed that we, uh, we finally. Um, came up with this idea and we took our, we took our, um, the, no, let, let me stop there, let me wait there and say that. The first thing I think, the first core part of the answer, which, which is not taken for granted here in, in the North America, but is taken for granted in Australia, is that you have to motivate the individual. Um, that's the only way. And you've got to use dedicated access privileges. We call it limited entry, we call it uh, user rights in, in uh, in Australia, but that seems to get people offside here. So dedicated access privileges is the, is the term to use in, in North America. And I think that's right, because along with the, the privilege, uh, fishing should be a privilege, and it's a right to earn an income, and with the privilege there should be responsibilities. And I'll argue very strongly that, that we've gone too far in Australia in, in giving out these rights where people can more or less do anything, and now we're trying to claw it back and say, yes, you have the right to fish, but you must be part of the process. You've got to supply information. And I'll get back to that. So, but the point here is that you, you must motivate people. And the only thing that really motivates people is self-interest. So you've got to think, be thinking systems that align self-interest with natural resource management. And I love this saying, which I've bastardised from Aldo Leopold. Relegating conservation to government is like relegating virtue to the Sabbath. It turns over to a very few professionals what should be the daily work of a vast army of amateurs. So this brings me to the importance of dedicated access privileges, the guaranteed rewards for long-term behaviour. You know, if that bay that I took the last five abalone out had been mine, I wouldn't have been taking them. I would have been getting the rest of my quota from somewhere sustainable and putting it back on the bottom in that bay. Totally different behaviour because I would have been guaranteed the reward. It's the only thing that motivates it. You have to find systems which motivate people to do the right thing. And when you use this term, dedicated access privileges or user right, unfortunately it's normally taken to mean ITQ and ITQ alone. But these access privileges can come in many, many forms. Pot licences, uh, California told me I think called stackable permits, gear time units, uh, so that, you know, the right to use a kilometre of net for a day. Uh, all of these can be tradable permits. We, most of our fisheries in Australia start off as just limited licences, limited number of boats, limited number of divers, and have evolved over time. Um, the one that I don't think has been used enough and is the only one that I think long term will optimise the abalone industry is turf, territorial user rights. This shouldn't be managed like a fishery at all. It should be managed like a vineyard or a forest or a veggie patch. That's the scale it operates. That's the scale we need people relating to it. People should have an area that they can buy and sell the right to harvest that area and they should be allowed to relate directly to the abalone in their area and work out for themselves with some technical advice whether the abalone they should harvest should be this size or that size. That's the scale we need, the behaviour. That's, ITQs is failing us, you know, that's a dedicated access privilege which is, it's bought us time but it's not solved the issue. Turf would solve the issue. So here's an Australian saying, horses for courses. The idea is if you have a, uh, you're betting on a horse and it's a firm, smooth field, you go for the animal with long legs, the, the thoroughbred, you put your money on that. But if it's just rain and it's a muddy course, go for the pony with the strong, powerful legs. It'll get your money back. So horses for courses. There's lots of forms of dedicated access privilege. But even if you get through to that point, you're still stuck with this. You know, there is still, even if you have these people down here wanting to do the right thing in the world for their fisheries, how are we ever going to feel the need of all the technical advice? And uh, that was where my friend and I were drinking and, and, and thinking about um, 
what, what the future would hold. And we got to the thing we took inspiration from was actually the Chinese experience with local community health after the war. The communists were trying to consolidate their grip on power and they knew that the revolution had always come out of the villages, out of the, the hinterland, and the main issue for the hinterland was low life expectancy and poor health. So what did they do? They didn't go and set up more universities and train more surgeons and put it into infrastructure in the, in the cities. They created the Barefoot Doctor program. They took people out of the communities. They recognised that 75% of health problems are generic. You know, sore throats, gastroenteritis, all the common things. You don't have to be a surgeon to solve them. They brought in the people from communities and gave them basic training and sent them back to the communities. It's a generic issue. They treat it generically with the Barefoot Doctors. And so we coined this phrase, the barefoot ecologists. So, and, and this is how I think the future will look. You know, I think at the moment there's a whole class of practitioners out there that are missing. You know, the people on this interface that, that I work on. Uh, interestingly, in, in Latin America, this is growing quite rapidly. You know, they're talking about barefoot ecologists. They have barefoot. Chile that went to Coletas, a former turf management in 92 has a whole class of operators in the university who are living entirely through consulting, supplying these generic needs to communities who have control of their own resources. They're self-organising. It's not all driven top-down. still very much top-down, but now there's this whole lot of motiva motivation driving bottom-up processes and this group of people supplying generic needs. And there's, there's, you know, there's still a role for everyone in here. The government agencies are still needed. A lot of the government agencies get very threatened by this type of talk. They think they're going to lose power. There's, you know, where are we going to get our research dollars from? But there's still a place for everyone in the system. There's just a whole level of generic need which isn't being filled at the moment. So barefoot ecologists, you know, agents of change, people who are working with the community, who are interested in the people as the, bi as the biology. You know, we're talking about empowering fishing communities and families and individuals to research and manage themselves. You know, we're talking about essentially the skillful use of fisher knowledge, uh, appropriate technology, you know, largely putting in, in monitoring systems and training fishermen to gather data, creating ways of evaluating that data. You know, this is a bit of my play on words. You know, a practical integrated generalists, ethno-socio-quantitative fisheries ecologists. And for, the, for a seminar I gave in Japan, on by, funded by the Japanese Sea Farming Association. You know, technology of the mind, not more hatcheries and production techniques. You know, let's do it smart. So what would be in the toolbox you need? The idea behind the barefoot was that they need toolbox. You know, they are coming to address a generic need. There's a need for a generic toolbox that we could all be using. So what are some of the things those barefoot ecologists would uh, be applying and, and putting into practice? Um, well, I think, first of all, the, the concept of scientific fishing. You know, this, isn't, this has got a bit of bad connotation since the Japanese whaling and uh, scientific fishing, but, but let me try and redefine find this. You know, the idea here is we have excess fishing capacity. We have too many people in fishing families. And I'm fascinated by more and more we're seeing the sons and daughters of fishermen turning up in institutes like this, wanting to train. And it's people like that we should be grabbing hold of and... and, and with their understanding and their already immersion in those communities, training to go back in, giving them the toolbox, training the toolbox and turning them to go back in. It's the idea we have too many boats. And fishermen, especially if you start having an ITQ system, you start having good management, you start having high catch rates. You know, at the moment the fleet just contracts down in size and, and the few, a few fishermen get wealthier. But really some of that time, some of their time spent on the water could be spent collecting data. And most in, in most situations, if you know what the fishing pattern is, you can make very small changes to what they're doing on the daily basis and they can be collecting quite useful, detailed information for almost no extra cost. Well, I think in Australia we, we also have user pay, so the, the direct cost of management and assessment and research all is sheeted back through licence fees. When the fishermen are sitting on those uh, budgetary committees and working out what they're actually paying, large scientific organisation to collect data, they start getting very interested in being inventive as to how they can get equivalent data for very little money. And it turns out to be there's enormous potential here to be covering ourselves in data. Uh, and often the scientists are very reactive. You know, the cynical part of me says that's because they're thrilling, feeling their jobs are threatened. The argument they actually use is, well, it's, the data's not precise enough. You know, we can't trust that data. But the point is, 
often by involving the fishing industry, you can get 100 times more data than you could with a research vessel. Then a lot of precision can be thrown away if you can increase the, the amount of observations that much. And you can still come out with far better estimation of trends. So, where are we going? Did I hit the right button? I know one of these slides is slow. Oh no, there we go. So here, here's a little example of scientific fishing. Um, orange ruffy, a seamount species which turns out to be basically localised. Here's a, the spawning aggregation of ruffy um, around a seamount called the Cascade. Tyner worked with me on this project. Here's one of our, for us this is a big boat, it's about 42 metres or something. So these guys spend a lot of time crisscrossing the aggregation for themselves anyway just uh, working out where to shoot. Um, we're now down to a very small TAC. We have these boats who are, who are out there anyway. So we start, set up a project where we actually just got, instead of just crisscrossing the, the main part of the aggregation where they're most interested in putting their shot, we'd insist they would go from end to end. This is actually a few uh, surveys on top of each other. But make sure they go all the way through the aggregation and back again so we actually have a good measurement. You know, and then if you're on board, yep, do the shot, have a look at the fish. You've got your, your, your catch composition data, you've got your, your size of aggregation data. No added cost to them. We're now, this, this is, I was just talking to Tyna last night, that we, when she was doing it with us, we, we actually stopped the fishery and had a research quota to go cover the spawning period so we get our data and then start the fishery again. The quota is much smaller now. You know, we're looking actually folding the two processes together. So basically the, the commercial TAC will be taken as part of the scientific process. We'll all be happy. Here's another idea for a shark fishery I'm involved in. I chair this uh, assessment group. The problem is it's very dispersed fishery right across southern Australia. Very expensive to put a research boat out there. This fishery is only worth about 16 million a year for about 35, 40 fishermen. Uh, how do you get the data? You know, we're doing a, um, an $800,000 uh, or we have been doing $800,000 research surveys. You know, what's that? About 5% of the value of the fishery. We set up a volunteer program. The fishermen pointed out that their first shot of every trip is actually quite an experimental shot. They go to a known ground. 80% uh, of the catch has come out of about 12% of the area of this fishery. They go to one of these main areas. They put their shot in pretty randomly. They look at what's in the net and they work out, should I be deeper, shallower, north or south? And then they start hunting from that pool of information. So it's a relatively untargeted shot. It's often low catch rate. No problem for them to measure every individual fish in that shot and collect that data. A relatively untargeted catch rate, size based, species composition data. Valuable data. We, first year we set up this voluntary program with 15% participation and we, we actually had a higher, um, um, uh, it was about equivalent to a survey, $800,000 worth of survey for basically, I think the organisational side took us $15,000. This is, I love this example, a bit of hurry up there. Um, Spencer Prawn Golf, Spencer Golf Prawn Fishery. They actually, uh, um, the, the problem was that there was a race to fish the smaller and smaller prawns in the shallow water, uh, raising environmental issues and low catch rates, low value prawn, instead of higher catch rates getting a very big premium prawn in deep water. So uh, scientists, government scientists working with the industry set up this survey system where the boats go out all across the whole fishing ground, they do experimental shots, they measure the number of prawns in a bucket, they ring him up like, on the phone, they get onto him, they have this at sea committee, he assesses the size information they're giving him and says, no, no, come home again, and they don't fish. This goes on for maybe a week. And then finally he says, okay, area 44, we're opening it up tonight. And as they fish that area, they report his, their, how many kilos they're doing per hour, gets down to a certain level, certain count per bucket, okay, come home. And that's how they manage the fishery. Have for uh, about, I guess it's going on 20 years now. You know, and look at the result of this one. The trawling is now confined to less than 12% of the available grounds. The length of the season has gone down from being uh, over 200 down to 61. Even the crew members are earning uh, um, 40 to 50,000 uh, for their 61 days work. Uh, the spawning biomass is being maintained up around 50% instead of down around a few percent for most of the other prawn fisheries. Uh, highly profitable. And, and, you know, there's a whole lot of ESD measures which are being met because they're fishing in such a small part of their grounds. I won't go into South Australian rock lobster. Oh, we, we used in that one, we, we actually made 
graphic software that, sim uh, that simulated and they could game with the software. And I'll show you a piece of that. So they got into their heads what was the assessment process was about, our uncertainties about the assessment. And from there, they got involved in, uh, they, we gave them, they, they would put a streamer on one pot in their fleet and we gave them an extra pot. They're on license limitation by pot number. They could have one tag pot and they were tagged, all the lobsters in that pot. Sure, some of them probably kept the size out of those pots. We could estimate that some of them had higher catch rates of size than, under, than others. But we got, uh, basically in a single season, we got about eight years worth of tagging data. Or what, equivalent of what we get normally in eight years and spread right across the fishery. The best view of what these movements are doing, what these animals are doing, and the best growth, estimates of area of growth that we've ever had. They also started collecting information about what was driving catchability, temperature and depth. Um, Amazing stuff by getting these guys involved in the process. So, scientific fishing. Next thing in the toolbox. You know, alternative forms of assessment and management techniques. Um, Bob Johannes is probably the, was the forefront of this sort of stuff, talking about dataless or rule of thumb management. Simple, common sense, robust management prescriptions. Or rapid assessment, the use of simple expert opinion based quali on qualitative indicators of exploitation or impact. The easiest way to illustrate this one is, is uh, you know, coral reef management. If you go to a village and the reef's all green, you know they've got a problem with over-harvesting the mollusk and the, the herbivorous fauna. All the coral reef is covered in, in uh, algae. You know, a simple expert thing like that, you don't need to do the research program. You can say, hey, we've got to control the exploitation of your herbivores. Uh, another one I'll talk a bit more, using size structure and shell shapes. But just distill the expert essence. You know, we experts get very clever at getting a feel for things. If we could just distill that down and start using that commonly so you can visually, you know, use your common sense. And I'll give you an example of, of how powerful we're finding that in abalone. And then a final idea I'm hoping to get through to about scale of stock assessment. Um, so rule of thumb management. Um, what we're seeing, a great example of it in the Pacific where, where we're seeing this growth, uh, really organic growth of community-based fisheries management. And, uh, and it's being recognised it's really a form of turf management. A lot of the governments are, are now placing less priority on creating normal fisheries departments and they've changed the law so these communities ha can have limited access to their own areas. And then they're through the village-based structures, they're working out what to do with the, their own resources. And they're not doing big scientific ex uh, exercises to work out what's going on. But when you look across here, what we've got here is a study of what these, these are, by Johannes, of what these are, um, different countries are doing in their communities. These numbers are how many communities are doing each of these things. And you see that by their own use of common sense, diagnosing their own problem, and saying what can we do about it, they've got a very great commonality. And it's all the essence of basically, uh, uh, you know, it's great stuff. They didn't need a scientist to tell them this, you know. Prohibitive destruct, destroying the environment. Um, uh, so protecting your environment. Often there's a lot of in, in, in here is uh, uh, protecting um, bio, the spawning biomass, you know, so uh, closures, um, here's protecting the environment by closing for reef invertebrates, uh, a range of things. But the, the point to show this out is actually when you empower people and let them start giving a bit of basic information and let them start having common sense, they produce startling results. So, just illustrating rule of thumb. You know, one of the rule of thumbs that comes out of that list and, and I think is a great rule of thumb in clients, not the only one, but one of them that comes out is, you know, preserve your breeding biomass. It's pretty common sense. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. I'll talk about one where we're just using shell shape of abalone. Um, but when you have a long-lived fish, another way of doing it is, is don't let them target the long-lived adults. Try and get your fishery just to focus on a couple of years of sub-adults. And then you have a big buffer, a big time lag goes on. Even if you over-exploit your juveniles, your sub-adults, a couple of years of sub-adults, the breeding bank takes a long time to run down with these low mortality animals. Um, so controlling, you know, dividing up your, your bottom with the best demir. An idea there is if it can stand an F of, say, 0.1, would strip up your bottom and only let them fish one out of ten strips a year. Make them roll, so you are actually protecting your, you know, a large amount of biomass. Um, don't let targeting spawning aggregations, gear selectivity, uh, the structured mangrove, all that sort of stuff comes out of that the common sense that these people have in the villages built for themselves and apply. So rule of thumb management. You know, we know a lot. We don't need to need need to know precise details a lot of the time. Just let's start applying what we need to know, what we do know. Like you have to have breeders if you want recruitment. This raises with 
Lobo, I always get into the where's, where's up one. I always with Lobo it keeps on going about, oh, the, managing the larval commons, how do you do this? Well, the point is if you actually preserve your breeding stock in all parts of your fishery, it doesn't matter what the sources in the sinks are. What we're finding in Australia in the coral reef is that sources in sometimes become sinks and sinks sometimes become sources. But if you're protecting your breeding stock everywhere, it really doesn't matter where the larvae are going. So, you know, let's not get too complicated. So, rapid assessment. What do you mean by rapid assessment? Well, there are lots of ways. It's distilling the expert knowledge. Um, and I'll best to illustrate this by what I'm doing with the abalone at the moment. Um, well, by talking to the fishermen and by putting our own science together, it turns out that you don't need a tagging study, uh, a study of, of fecundity to do your spawning for recruit. You don't need all that science. I mean, it's nice to have it, great to have it. And if we didn't have it, we wouldn't understand what we understand. But for every one of these reefs, we don't need all that information. We don't need a full-blown stock assessment for, for each reef. It turns out you can look at the shell and you can see all this variability in size and maturity. And it has to do with, and it was divers who put me onto it and helped me verify it was going on. The abalone start off in the back of the crevices as juveniles. They emerge as they start maturing. So they come out from under the rocks, having lived in the dark, they have flat, clean shells with no fouling on. They come out into the sunlight, start putting, building gonads, building volume and weight in their shell, and, and uh, they get fouling on their shell. So you teach the divers this. You teach that, you know, this is a group of animals coming out, there's a juvenile just emerging, coming all the way through. In this fishery, that's legal. That should be the size limit. So they start in the back of the caves and they emerge. And you can see it going on in their shells, whether it's this size or that size. You know, and this is what you're com commentating on. Here's a, this is a growth curve length, that's weight, this is spawning per recruit. We tend to fish them back to the emergent stage if the size limit allows us. Down here. You know, here's, this, here's the weight. If you can move them back from fishing a clean oval shell up to fishing a fouled and rounded shell, look at this gain in spawning per recruit you get. You know, it's thousands of folds increase in spawning per recruit. It's about when you do the, the sums of the yield per recruit, it's a 200% increase in just a couple of years. So we're teaching the, the divers this. We're teaching them to read abalone shells. You know, this is, this is a slide out of a presentation I use, hammering it into these divers. You know, the juvenile abalone remain hidden. Their shells are, are clean. Um, they move out of the cryptic habitat when they start maturing. Maturing animals should, should be allowed several years of breeding before they're taken. When a catch is comprised predominantly of clean, flat shells, the reef is being recruitment overfished. Individual abalone are being, not being left to attain full adult fecundity. There will be insufficient breeding. They use this information most powerfully. We, we have a decision tree. Every reef they can run through this decision tree and come out with eight categories of exploitation with an agreed management plan for each. And they're, they're working it out. They're making the most remarkable um, decisions. You know, they, they are now actually overpowering the zonal stock assessment. The first group I worked with four years ago asked for a 25% TAC reduction, so they start closing up the most overfished reefs. Just this year, another group um, asked for a 100 ton reduction on, from their 700 tons, which the zonal assessment said it was quite stable. You know, they, they've got all these different size limits and they're, they're having effects, they're seeing the effects, they're getting more motivated, more people are coming into the process. The process is growing and spreading across the zones. Scaleless assessment, you know, this is, I won't run through this, uh, really you can do it without, no, without all the assumptions of what, what the size of the stock is, the area of the stock, just using like an open heart VPA, you know, first of all you assess your, your basic trend in, in prime CPUE, uh, and then look at your size structure. Sure, if you, your uh, catch rate is increasing, that might indicate a, uh, you should increase catches. But if your proportion and, and number of uh, catch rates of old fish are going down, it actually indicates that the uh, fishing power is growing, and the things are getting worse. And so we, we came up with this idea for tuna, well, uh, Tasman Sea tuna, because we didn't know the linkages to the wider Pacific stock. We wanted to react to what was going on in our own, own fish, but we couldn't work out where to draw the boundary on the stock. And thinking about learning about, in June, learning about rockfish, you can do this on that scale of, of individual reefs, you know, a kelp bed. You can go and use this sort of, if you know your spawning per recruit parameters, you can work out without knowing who's impacting, where the larvae is coming from and going to, who's impacting this, you can say there's not enough spawning per recruit. And you can incrementally change your catch levels to work out what's stable. 
So, you know, this is, I'll run through this. This is, it's, this is the information it's using. This is, a, you know, a size based, we all know this, how fishing impacts size structure and age structure. And I'm just illustrating a classic overfishing. And this is the type of information with uh, here, the recruits down here, and the prime here, and the, uh, the old fish here. And illustrating the type of information that's in this, uh, what I call scale of stock assessment. And it turns out this works very, very well. You know, this is the thing. Here's the basic rule at the top. You say, is the catch rates rising or stable or falling? Then you ask yourself these questions about the CPU of old and the proportion of old. And if you're under rising, that prescribes different things. If you're stable, that prescribes different things. And basically, you know, if you've got uh, catch rates are rising, but, it's, but your CPU of old fish is declining, you actually, instead of getting a catch increase, you get a catch reduction. And incrementally, you feel your way towards where stability is. And so we've done, so we're only implementing this at the moment. But we've done this, this here. Here is a results of a um, MSC, basically, evaluation of the process. So here's your indicator, CPU prime, portion old. And you just step through the time. And you see, it, and here it's stepping around this uh, various diagnoses in these years. And I'll just run through it. And it behaves surprisingly nicely. We actually put this decision, made this decision tree as a draft and, and haven't, having evaluated in all sorts of ways, we actually haven't changed it at all. You know, and this way you avoid all of the complex assumptions of, of what's the boundary of the stock, what's a unit stock. Um, all you need is your basic biological parameters to do a spawning poor recruit type of analysis. And, uh, you know, and here, so what, what a, um, we're, this is an idea we're actually implanting into California for the rockfish with the idea that these, these fishermen, live fishermen, they're working to strict limits. They're actually visually thinking about every fish and estimating its weight. If it's too big, they know they get a low price, they don't want to go over their catch limits, they put it back. If it's the right size, they keep it. Let's capture that data. There, there's size-based catch rates straight away. You could run it through this. The biology behind spawning per recruit is far simpler to document than the other assumptions based on needed for quantitative assessment about what's the unit stock, what catches go in, what catches aren't in, what's the linkages. Forget all that. Just start watching the fish and responding to the fish. So the final thing, running out of time, is just the final element of the toolbox that I think we neglect is the power of visualisation. You know, most of this stock assessment bullshit is common sense if you can visualise it. And I want to illustrate that with a, um, a little model that I've just made up for sea cow, dugong. You know, we have a traditional right to hunt in our north of Australia. And it's been out of sight, out of mind for the managers for a long time. But now the biologists involved are ringing a warning that, that they think we might be going to traditionally hunt into extinction, this, this dugong. But we have almost no data. We have a lot of biology but no data. And, and I was asked to go and do a, a first stock assessment with the aim of putting it into educational software. So let me just show you, illustrate the power of visualisation which we neglect. So here's this, here's this software. That's, um, where did I put that? What we have here, I thought that was me ringing. Um, we have up here the population estimate and it's size structured, I mean uh, category structured. Male is blue, female is red. Um, these animals down here are the uh, are calves that are suckling, these are the, the weaning animals, these are the adult breeding animals, and here's your catch. And what you very quickly demonstrate, you know, this is, uh, hang on, here we go, am I? Right there, make sure I'm in here. Okay. So what I've got going on here is a catch of 1,500 animals a year, which we think is uh, overfishing and driving a depletion. Now, this is assuming a, a sex ratio of uh, one to one. And in fact, it's actually probably more females than males because they think the females are, are fatter and tastier. And it turns out, because this is like managing cows in a paddock, and there's a very strong relationship between the area of seagrass and the density of, of dugongs, you know, it is basically a cow in a paddock thing. So if you, instead of doing one to one, say only take three females for every male, Look at the result you get. You know, the catch isn't the problem. It's actually the sex ratio. 
And that's not what I want to tell you about. What I want to demonstrate was you visualise this stuff and it's much easier to understand and much more impactful. And yet, you know, we're getting so sophisticated in our, pity Andre isn't here, in our Bayesian approaches, in fact, and it's the exact opposite trend of visualising and making, communicating and making some things simple and clear. You know, we're, we're arguing about fairies dancing on a pinhead, I'd argue, when, when, in fact, you know, it should be much more about bringing in the graphic artists and stuff and helping us get this information out and making this common sense. And so then, that's really... Um, that's basically, I just wanted to very quickly then mention, this is to bring it all together in the Barefoot Colleges toolbox, which was the idea that Philip, who I, we hatched up the idea about Barefoot Colleges back in the early 90s, and he died very unexpectedly. We were working on this type of software and this idea actively in 94 when he died very unexpectedly of cancer, and it's been in abeyance. And now, just in the last year or so, there's in, increasing interest. There's, in fact, a Spanish-speaking group who we had a workshop in November with Lobo and Anna, and they're actually chasing EU funding to try and put together, you know, a, Software and the idea is the Spanish idea was to make it an open source project. You know that there are these bits of, of the puzzle are all lying out there, scattered around in our field, and and if we actually got together, we could put it all together in a pretty short time. And and why shouldn't we all be learning? You know, thinking about these generic issues and coming up with a generic so, uh, software toolbox with all the information. You know, this Lee's laptops are an incredibly powerful tool, and we should be using them more as a corporate group to confront the issues that are definitely out there. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not so interested in saying one of these prescriptions is going to solve all the issues. You know, I'm interested in the toolbox. That there's a lot of different approaches that can work, still incorporating these, you know, the spirit of this sort of stuff, and be applied in different ways. And I'm not saying that there's no no um, no place for the hard nose, hard line science thing as well. You know fishery the scale of Pollock or something like that, you've obviously got the wealth in the fishery and, and you obviously want to be super guarded and conservative about, you know, putting in jeopardy a stock like that. And so, you know, it justifies a, a high level scientific process. Um, and you can do it, obviously. But in other cases you can't. And so that's really where, you know, and so we're, we're in tuna, we have that same issue that you referred to of, you know, you don't have obvious visual markers. So we've got that approach of just trying to use the fishermen there because they export that catch. We have individual weights of basically every animal that's caught. Let's, and, but the thing we can't do and the thing we're going to argue with scientists about from now until doomsday is what does a unit stock mean? What should be, you know, what catches should be in the stock assessment for the Tasman Sea and what should be out? At the moment, the, there's a Western Central Pacific stock assessment that we're part of. We're 2% of those catches. The main stock is the stock assessment is driven by a 200,000 ton catch north of New Guinea. We don't think we're connected, but we might be. So here's a way we can watch our fish. If we are connected, we'll see the signs of that. And along with working through you know, a, a regional fisheries management organisation at that level to solve the broader regional overfishing, we'll be addressing our, our own issues. But if we're not, if we're watching our own fish and we're not part of that issue, then we'll be manipulating our own catches either up or down in response to what the fish are doing. So I, I think the idea about morphology and stuff, I actually think it's probably common to most gastropods. It can probably apply to almost all gastropods. You see this, the, the curve they're growing on, there's geom geometry to it. I forget the name of the person whose spiral it is. Some Greek guy described it. But it's a spe specific spiral that, that is mainly in two dimensions. And what I'm seeing is that the point where it really branches off and goes from two dimensions more into three dimensions always seems to coincide with the point of maturity. 
You know, you recognise that and you can start seeing it. Go to shell collections. You can, so then you can start, go to a Pacific island and just look at it and say, oh, well, you know, these animals are all immature. They're going to have problems on this reef. I think the big difference is actually not the education. I think you can have very smart, uneducated people. I think the difference is the presence or absence, absence of dedicated access privileges. You look at what went on in Chile since '92. Very low level of education in, in, in their fishermen, and yet because they could start controlling their coletas and the access to those areas, they've developed very sophisticated behaviour. In '94, there was a crash in the world abalone market, and they sell their loco into the world abalone market. We, in our sophisticated, educated way in Australia with a quota system, kept stuffing our unwanted product into that market. What are those uneducated, maybe, you know, are they dumb fishermen doing chili? What they did was they stopped fishing that year because they worked out it was better to have that stuff breeding on the bottom than to shove it into an overstuffed market. They wouldn't have done that before they had their Coletta system, though. Yeah, I, I mean, I think part of their process is looking at, um, part of their process is assessing processes. So in some cases, uh, as long as there is a process for addressing an issue, um, then, you know, the stock is a bit depleted, but they've got the process in train. So I would, my advice to them would be think about that in terms of this. You know, is the process in place, what's in place, and get less concerned with uh, uh, um, proving that the stock is necessarily B48 or B50 or something like that and, and look more at the processes behind it. No, again, I wouldn't make the, the definition turf. I'd make the definition dedicated access privileges. To me, that's the big change in behaviour. So that where you have people wanting, fishermen wanting, who feel their rights are protected in the long term. We see without being turf, we don't have... I'll make the statement, it's not strictly true, but more or less we don't have any turf management in Australia. Uh, I would like to have more, and I believe we're leading evolution towards it in, in abalone. But we don't have any. But we have almost universal dedicated access privileges. And the types of behaviour we see is quite amazing. You know, fishermen do not count their wealth. When you, are, you know, get them to, if you can sit around, we don't tend to do it, but if you sit around and get them to add up what they're worth, they don't count their boat, they don't count their factory or their sheds, they count up the number of access privileges they have. And when you see that, you know, they're, they're, you, get a, you get a management dividend out of access privileges. You licence your access privilege can be calculated as a multiplier of what you gross in a year. An unmanaged fishery that no one has confidence in is worth one times what you can gross in a year. When you start having well managed, a long history of good management, stability in the fishery, and even better, start to have recruitment indices that predict the future, we get out to the access privilege worth 10 to 12 times what you can gross in a year. It's like land. We have individuals and companies in our system who are working their, their involved engagement in the process is all about optimising the value of their assets in the long term. They'll take big, they are often ring the alarm bell before the stock assessments are picking it up. They are willing to take cuts. You know, we, we now have 
in this abalone thing, these guys are being more conservative than the stock assessment would push them to be. And it's all about their long-term welfare. You know, the, the interest of the resource is lined up with, with the, their own long-term interest. You know, thinking about retirement, they're thinking about when they're going to sell it some in the future. If they, buy, if they have to borrow a million dollars to buy in, they've got to have 10 years, 12 years return to even think about them paying that off. So you change, you fundamentally change. That's when people become interested in not only being constructive in management committees, but constructive in stock assessment processes. Go a step further and start charging them the, the, for user pay. Start charging them what the cost of research is worth. You'll find out how interested they get in supplying data and starting to do this sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and you can put other things on that. You know, the, the, hard, the really hard ones that the, really the system fails on are very long-lived cumulative biomasses that are virgin. You know, everyone just wants to race for the gold pot. But, yeah, I've, I've definitely seen that. I can count a number of times that when the fish, when they've really felt threatened, you know, the Western Rock Lobster Fishery is a great example of that, that it was, everything was rampant in there, overpotting the whole works, and they drove it right down and... Uh, um, back in the 70s, they turned it around because they got so desperate. And we see that quite often, that when things get really desperate, um, um, that's when you start having unity in the organisation. They can all agree on one thing, it's stuffed. And then they also, the fear of change is much less. You know, they, you become convinced you have to have change, and, and, uh, whereas a lot of people just fight change because it's change. But when you get to a stage where no one can deny change is needed, things change really rapidly. And I think we underestimate actually how resilient these resources are often as well at uh, turning around. And you can just, if you can turn that corner, you get really great positive feedback that can really build a process. Great question. Great question. Uh, and, and I have to say that I think the... Um, Recreational issue is the, really the sleeping giant for us all. Um, I, they have all, you know, they are, we're only just in Australia waking up to what a problem we have, and it's like looking at our commercial fisheries 40 years ago. They don't accept they're part of the problem. We can't manage, we can't measure what they catch. We don't actually can't manage, you know, and the biggest problem is we, how do you handle dedicated access privileges in a recreational sense? And, and uh, you know, I just, I do not see sustainability being possible without dedicated access privileges. It's as black and white as that for me. And so the real issue is how we're going to deal with that in a recreational setting. Um, I don't have the prescription. I'm convinced that education, 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 education is, is a major part of it. But then also forming up those senses of community. And so trying to formulate a a quasi-dedicated access privilege. So I think working with clubs, working with um, 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 charter boat operators, that sort of thing. And I think also it's, it's hard, and talking about Tragedy of Commons, who pointed out that the solution to Tragedy of Commons is not technical. It's, uh, it's about changing the way we do things, and it's about giving up accepted freedoms. You know, and back in the 60s when Australia convince the fishermen in their own best interest to give up the accepted freedom of everyone can go fishing and move to dedicated access privilege. And somehow we're going to have to get that message through the recreational sector. We have a lovely reception. Uh,